was uh, born in Mons, Belgium, and uh, I uh, I was uh, out of uh, I was one of five children, and uh, we lived uh, all together in the town for uh, as long as I was born. I mean, I was at the time of the war. It was I was seven years old, so I was born in 1933, and my uh, I was the youngest of of them all and uh, my oldest one was uh, 12 years older than I was and uh, that's just a range of uh, children that we were you know like one, uh, 7, 10, 14 and 16 and 17 actually they were their age. The general atmosphere was uh, very 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 nice I mean it was peaceful and uh, the, uh, the war, I mean, I guess the adults at the time, because I was only seven, must have expected the war. But I wasn't aware of it. And since I was, my environment was still of a young age, I couldn't determine what the problems could have been. So therefore, my life was more or less like any child of seven. You know, just go to school and and come home and so forth and eat and, uh, and, and go, go to sleep. I guess that's about all. It happened on May 10th. I recall the date because I'll never forget it. And that was the day where a siren final, you know, suddenly uh, went on. And we, you know, my bro I was working with my older brother and uh, he made me go into a, uh, a school which had a cellar. And obviously, he must have been told, in case of a siren, to go into a cellar because planes could come and bomb, you know, and uh, shoot and bombard the, the, uh, the, the town. So therefore, that was the first thing that occurred to me. On May 10th, at 10 o'clock in the morning, we ran into the cellar, into the school, and we went into the cellar and we waited until the siren you know, would terminate, and therefore we, we can come out and then go about our lives. Uh, effectively, we stayed there for about an hour or so, and the siren came off, and obviously planes went above us and kept, uh, and probably uh, did bombs certain, uh, certain, certain areas, which I wasn't familiar with, but uh, obviously after we came out, everything was fine. Thereafter, a few days later, the war was, was declared. We had to take measures. And my mother and father decided, in order to avoid the invasion, that we should go to England. So everybody in the town started to converge with all their luggage and so forth towards the, 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 uh, the, the, the railroad station in order to get a train to go to Calais, which the boats would have been available to go to England, because England was, in the, uh, was not attainable by the Germans at the time, and we thought that that would be the best refuge for us to have. So we all got onto these trains by the thousands, and we finally went off, and uh, during the course of the, uh, of the travel, planes, um, uh, German planes used to go by and shoot at us. So we all had to disperse uh, outside the wagons and then wait until the, uh, the, 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 the bombing would, would stop. In the meanwhile, the railroads were, were completely bombarded and they were, un, you know, trains were unavailable, were not able to continue. As a result, we just packed with everything we had and we walked. And you could see thousands of people walking down the, 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 these roads and uh, going towards Calais. And I remember, uh, being seven years old, I had to walk something like 20 miles a day until we finally, each, we finally reached somewhere the distance between Calais and where we lived. To, that, that went on for several days until finally the Germans caught up with us. They came with these huge tanks and they were traveling at 30, 40 miles an hour and they were catching up with us 
at a too fast a rate. So therefore, the, the, the only issue we had was what do we do now? Is that we go back? So we turned around and we walked back until we were able to get some sort of transportation where another, another station would be bombed. And then we tried to get trains to go back to where we came from. And therefore, and that's how the Germans caught up with us. They went much too fast and uh, nobody, there was no, no resistance from the part of the French army, which would, would dug in on each side of the roads and they had no orders to fight. So as a result, they got out themselves, put on civilian clothes and dispersed among the population. They say, why are they doing something? Because they never got the orders from the generals and the, as a result, they just didn't know what to do. And they stayed there for days in these trenches and some of them, and uh, we kept talking to them, and uh, he says, nothing we can do. He said, we don't have any orders. As Pétain and Laval uh, were generals at the time, and they were, the, they were under their command, and they would never give them the order to fight. Effectively, they all cooperated with the Germans later on, as we knew. Uh, but that, that was only known later on. Well, therefore, we decided to go back. And uh, what else could we do? Going back to my house, to my, uh, the house that we left. And uh, when we got there, we finally made it after a few days of traveling from one station to the next and going from one train, trans transport, transport trains, whatever means of transportation we could get. Cars were out of the question. There was no gas, nothing to be had, so cars were immobilized. So therefore, there was no cars. And uh, you had to use your own imagination in order to get anywhere, or what to eat, or whatever. You, just, you would get a, a piece of bread from a, a farmer on the side of the road. He would, they, would, they would provide us with some food. So they were very nice that way, and that's how we were able to survive. The idea when we went back, as uh, the windows were, sh were shattered, they were broken because the, the railroad station was nearby and they would bomb, the Germans would bomb the, the, that station and as a result the pieces of rail would just go flying all the way up to the, on top of the roof and would, you know, provide us with air conditioning by going right through the house. <laughs> so we had to you know, fix it the best we could, and therefore we just remained there and had things fixed the best we could. And uh, this went on day to day. We, I went back, the schools when, when were open again, and therefore I went back to school, and uh, so did the rest of my uh, brothers and sisters. And my father, he tried to get some work from, from people. I guess uh, he tried to do odds and odd jobs in order to provide there's some kind of uh, means of support. Therefore, uh, it wasn't easy, I'm sure, on this side. But uh, my mother always, uh, always tried to provide for us, and, and I'm sure she tried to go from person to person to, to, uh, try to uh, try to get food for us. The Germans occupied in Mons. Mons is the capital of a province, so it's a, a, a decent-sized town. In which case, every town of that size had a garrison. At the time, it used to be the Belgium garrison, but they're no longer there. So the Germans occupied them, and they they put a, a, I would say the size of a of a battalion, which is around uh, 800 soldiers. It was quite a big garrison. So they had about 800 soldiers in there and they would patrol the town uh, in, uh, in about, uh, I would say 30, 30 to 40 soldiers at a time. And you could hear them walk because they would sing 
they would sing out loud and they would have those cleats on the bottom of their boots and they would make this crazy noise <laughs> that's clack, clack, clack on the cobblestone. It were, you couldn't possibly avoid hearing it. So they would walk through every, every street in the town to, uh, you know, to patrol the area. Uh, at the time, they were worried that uh, there may be some resistance. They would have some resistance, but they, 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 for, fortunately, uh, everybody was hiding and they were so busy with themselves, the resistance never really took place, but about a year later, because there was no, uh, there was no organization. The general population did not have interaction. The only thing, the interaction that I had, and we had to have it because my father was a tailor. And most officers or non-com office, uh, non wouldn't have uniforms, they would fit them right. So they would ask the people in town, where can I find a tailor? And they obviously send it to us. So that's how the only interaction we had with them was with the, you know, because my father was a tailor. Fortunately, my father was in Berlin in 1924 and married my mother there and moved to Paris thereafter. So he knew the, the language and that was a big help. So he knew how to, you know, he knew how to converse with those Germans. But the fact that we were Jew, Jewish, may, gave, us, gave us quite a scare. The scare was that in 1940, they didn't start the purge yet. Until 1941, then they required that all the Jews wear those yellow uh, stars on their arm. So you got them from the city hall and every Jew had to go to city hall to, <coughs> to get these, these stars to put on their, on their, on their garments. And uh, we did so because there were no raffles. In other words, people were, weren't being kidnapped at night like it was in 1942 and 43. As time went on, the Germans undertook la 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 larger and larger, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, gatherings of uh, people to First. send to concentration camps. I mean, actually, adults knew that the Germans were, purge, were purging the Jews from Germany and they were doing things to them exactly what, maybe killing them, maybe putting them in prison. But the concentration camp weren't into, uh, in their minds yet because it wasn't, it was unknown at the time. But they know they were in prison or they, they would kill them or they would do something. But exactly what we didn't know. All Jews were required to register at the at city hall and at the police station uh, within a certain time. My father became very busy with this, this, German, this German army and therefore he never found the time to go. When he finally, he finally went because uh, the, somebody was, was elected to be the chief of all the Jews in the town and he, he, he kept t t telling my father, you must go to register because they're after me. Therefore, you must do something, go and register. So they leave me alone. So finally, my father went, but as he went, he was lucky enough to have found an employee, a Belgian employee, who said to him that the list already had been sent to, to uh, Berlin. And as a result, to leave things alone, that he had five children, that to stay, you know, to stay put, and therefore not to worry. So my father went home and we decided, let's take the patches off. And that'll eliminate that, you know, the, the, the problem. So we all eliminated the, the, the patches and we hoped and prayed that they, we wouldn't, wouldn't get caught. We had an average of about 10, 15 families uh, that we knew who were customers of my father and there were, there were merchants in town and so forth. So I would say 80% got caught. They would come in the middle of the night and they would bring a truck and take everything with them. And you would never see them again. I had uh, friends who actually, uh, I mean, I was, I had a mix. I, I had a, such a mix friends that didn't matter whether he was Jewish or not. I mean, I didn't particularly, you know, pick. 
it, we weren't that many Jews. I mean, you know, 10 families out of a population of 40,000, what is it? It's nothing. So therefore, I says, my friends were all Catholics. As a matter of fact, where I played in my, I had next to my house, we had a collegial, and that was the best place to play. We had stairs and slides, and oh, we had a terrific time there. And when I go in, I would make the sign of the cross. And that's the way I did it when I went to, to uh, Catholic schools. I did the Hail Marys every morning and the Hail Marys when I left. <laughs> I just, I never showed that I was any different than any other kid. I, I, fortunately, we didn't look Jewish. That made that, that was a big help. We were constantly under fear, the anxiety of being caught, and also the lack of, uh, the lack of nutrition and uh, so forth. So, I mean, it's just, there isn't much that I can recall that was very happy in my life at that time. I don't think it was the case with everybody for that matter. So I don't think anybody was happy. Uh, anybody who survived the war, there's nothing good to say about it. Because you know, the German really, really confiscated every last bit of very little thing that was worthwhile. They were real thieves and it pillaged the whole population. It was awful. It was awful. And they had no regard for human, for the human uh, being. So what can we say? So I guess like any war is, is, a dirty, is a dirty thing. And uh, effectively, everybody who registered at their radio confiscated. As a matter of fact, the population's radio were, pop were confiscated thereafter. But at first, the Jews, everything was confiscated from them. And my father's was the only friend that he had was the BBC, which is the British Broadcasting Company from London, where he received all the news from the war and so forth. And he lost that, he had no friends, to, to, you know, no, nobody, no, no, no companion. So therefore, we survived this way, and uh, we did a few things in order to survive. We, we planted, we were given a piece of land in some area where everybody could plant potatoes so that we could have some food. And so we did that, my brothers and I, we went every morning, we dug the ground and we planted spuds and therefore, and when the time came, we went and collected them. Grocery store were closed, everything was closed. Uh, effectively, uh, no, there was no deliveries of any kind uh, for the longest time. So whatever they had, they probably got rid of it in within hours and there was nothing left to be had. So therefore, it was a, it was a very dilemma, a big dilemma to, to, to try to survive. So we had to, my, I don't recall what my mother and father did in order to feed five children, but it wasn't easy, I'm pretty sure. And the black market naturally went full blast where you could get a bread for two dollars at the time. It was so exorbitant, but there was no other way to get around. And people who had money managed to survive. My father, being a custom tailor, was not the wealthiest guy. And as a result, I mean, he just had barely any savings because of the five children's, the expenses that he incurred. As a result, I mean, we just did the best. I remember I've eaten at least once a day. I had no youth, so to speak. There were no toys, so I, I wasn't provided with any toys. I never, my first toy, I think, was, a, was a, a, a tank, which my uncle brought me from somewhere when he was in Paris, and he, he, sne he sneaked it in through the, uh, the customs, and he managed, so it was the only toy I ever had. I, re I remember when I was eight years old, Something. It was the only toy. I never had any toys. And candy was non-existent. Candy, sugar, all that was, never existed. So we didn't know. So I got more or less candy deprived, but I made up as soon as the Americans showed up. Boy, did I make up. <laughs> Anything I could get in my hand that was sweet, I, I, I absorbed. The black market was always there and it was very expensive because the average, the average food uh, given out to the population was the wheat that they sifted. The Germans used to sift 
And the rem, I mean, what, what is that called in, in English? I don't know. Uh, the, the pa that sifted, they made bread out of it, which had no nutritional value. But this is what they, the, the, the natives, I mean, the population was cooking, you know, was baking for themselves because the Germans would steal all the wheat. They would, you know, they, they, they confiscated everything that was of value. Uh, when, I became, when I went into the third grade, I remember an incident which broke so, uh, so much in my mind, was a German officer walked in the class and he claimed, it was in the early, uh, 1942, and he claimed uh, that uh, all Jews had to register with the principal, that he would come at 12 o'clock to pick up the list. And there he was, 10 o'clock in the morning, and I didn't know what to do. I knew I was Jewish, and I think I was the only Jew in the class. And uh, so I put my name in, not being as, as old as I was, I didn't realize they was gonna, you know, they would be that bad. And if I didn't, I probably would be punished. So therefore, I did what I was told to do. So therefore, I put my name in, and I went home uh, for lunch, and I told my, since uh, in Europe, at the time, every kid had an hour for lunch, he would eat at home. They would, there was no such thing as cafeterias and things where he would eat there and go on. I and mean, every kid was sent home and he would eat at home. So therefore I told my father and my father immediately sent my brother to the principal's house to remove my name from the list. So I realized that what a mistake I had made. And sure enough, uh, he removed the name of the list. He says, don't worry, we found out later on that he was also part of the resistance, which was a, a very good thing. Uh, and fortunately, part of the population were aware that the Germans were, uh, were picking up Jews, that, they, that nobody knew that we were Jewish, and uh, they just didn't know. So therefore, we just survived. But it was a daily scare, a daily scare, walking in the street, doing it. You never knew from one minute to the next whether you would be taken, taken away by the Germans. You, you never knew. Somebody could squeal, somebody, you know, and anybody. So it was a daily uh, anxiety attacks. And my father had to deal with these people, and many times he would have arguments with them because the older Germans would say, well, my son is in the East Front and they, they're killing him over there. And my father would say one time, he said, so you see what Hitler did to you guys? I said, see what he did to you? So right away they would jump on my father's throat and I said, that would be the end. He learned his lesson very fast that he wasn't supposed to, to have any kind of rebuttal. <laughs> When a German would say something like that, he was a Nazi number one, man number two, and father number three. And he couldn't care less if son was doing and it was being killed or not. So therefore, that's the way the things went on. And my brother, who was 17 at the time, joined the underground, and he was taking people to, to, uh, through Vichy France. Vichy France was... Uh, part of France that was the Germans gave to the French under their own, uh, an, uh, as an authorization that they wouldn't have any occupation. But they, but they still would, uh, the government of Vichy would have to cooperate with the Germans and get all the directives from them. As a result, my brother on the way back from Switzerland taking some very important people, he knew the way and he, with several other comrades uh, he went to, to, uh, to take him to Switzerland, which was a neutral country at the time, and he was able to pass him through Switzerland. And then he would make, come back and make another run. And on the way back, he got caught, and uh, he was incarcerated in Poitiers. And uh, thereafter, about a few months, we got a few letters through the Red Cross, which was the only agency that people could, could uh, you know, could, you know, could get in touch with in order to get to get mes messages to to their own families, and uh, and also to send a package if we could, but everything was already was was investigated. 
packages were open and letters were read and so forth before the, uh, the, 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 the people in the, in the prisons would get it. So uh, therefore my uh, brother got sent to, to a convoy that was due to go to Auschwitz. And that was in 19, late 1942. And we have never heard from him since. Well, I remember the, the, the violent arguments that my parents used to have because he was doing this kind of work. And being 17, I mean, he was still young. And I remember that my father, you know, screamed and so forth, don't go, don't go. But uh, he, he, he was helping us in a way. He was able to get a lot of food through the organization that he, he, you know, he joined. And therefore, he helped the family. And that was his way of helping the family survive. And that's how he was able to do it. And therefore, uh, we just paid the price for it. That's it. It was a thing that normally people would do. Uh, there was, we were receiving, even though we lived in a kind of a uh, part of, of Belgium where it wasn't really that populated, we received a lot of people in transit to go to England. They used to live in our house. We were five kids and we were sleeping three in a bed because we had to, we had to uh, give up the beds for other people. We had Russian prisoners who escaped. I, had a, I, had a, I once remember having a Russian there for, the, for two months, he even taught me a Russian song, uh, <laughs> which I found out wasn't very clean, but I think it was an army song. And then uh, there were a lot of Jews and also a lot of uh, priests and uh, political prisoners. So they went through our uh, house and stayed there for a while until the underground would take them away to go to the next to the, to the next station, wherever they had to go. So that's what I remember. So we always had a lot of people in the house. But we were scared every day was an anxiety attack to, to know that they, uh, God forbid, they, somebody should recognize us uh, as Jew, as a Jew. Uh, uh, as a result, uh, we just, uh, it wasn't very a pleasant situation for all of us, really. What he did was more or less like being in the army and fighting. And I thought, you know, it's just like anybody else has a son or a brother going into the service and being killed on the battlefield. I would say that's about the same, uh, uh, the same feeling that I, you know, that, that, that I felt at the time, that he was like a soldier and therefore fell on the battle, the battlefield. So uh, that's, that's the only thing we remember. But it was always a, a battle in the house. Why, why was he going? Why is he going? Why is he? And that was, uh, you know, something we, we, my mother always regretted not being able to do to keep him out. The war itself, every day was a daily battle because we, lived, we were in, a dire, in the uh, direct line of bombing between uh, England and Germany. Planes would have to go over my town in order to get there. Regardless whether, the, you never knew if whether the planes were going to bomb you, the siren would run. And it would run like about 10 times a day. And what you would end up doing, if you were in school, you would go to every 10 minutes, you would go to the cellars. So you end up spending three quarters of your life in cellars. Now, sometimes the planes would hit the railroad stations because there were German convoys and they would hit the, 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 the schools. The schools were out of commission. We had to integrate with the Catholic schools, which were further into the town for four years, I mean, let's face it, the, 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 the ally didn't show up until June 6, 1944. Don't forget May, May 10th, it started. 
So this is four years. And four years under the Germans wasn't a really a picnic. So it took about four years and we couldn't wait for them to come and deliberate us. Well, I despised them throughout. So the fact that my brother never came back and he was only 17 made me feel like I, I really felt uh, at 13, you really, your resentment is such that uh, the German never really did, did, did anybody any good. They really never did. They never did anything that, uh, that we can praise them for. If there was any attempt to do anything, they, they would gather 10, 15 people a day and they would shoot them on the Grand Place, you know, on the main square, just for, for retribution for what the, the resistance used to blow up maybe a, a depot of some kind, and they would constantly do it, and you would get that in the papers every day. And the propaganda, they would shoot at us all the time, that they were winning the war, and this and so forth, so on, which, which they weren't, but uh, the, with the BBC, we used to keep up abreast of all the news that we needed to know. Otherwise, I mean, there was, if you had no radio, you, there was no way of knowing, really. You had to go by what the Germans gave you. And I said, is there such a thing as a god? And as a child, you say to yourself, why am I praying? Am I praying to what? To a god who's not, you know, uh, sympathetic to all the things that go on in this thing. Children being blown and this, and this and that. And so it's very difficult to, to, uh, to pinpoint how you feel at a certain time. You just uh, gather everything you can and you do, you know, and you go on. And that's it, you go on. We were living in a small village because our house had, had gotten hit pretty bad with the railroad, uh, railroad tracks through the roofs and through the who, who knows what else had broke. And therefore, we, the house was in complete, uh, it was being repaired and we had to move into a small village. And the village was being uh, liberated by the Americans at the time. And I happened to be in the main square. And the Germans were picking up hostages on the way, trying to avoid, trying to uh, escape at a very fast rate through these trucks. They would pick up people as hostages and they would put them in the back of the truck and try to run away from the, uh, from the Americans. And as a result, the American tax didn't disregard the hostages, and they would just shoot at those, those trucks, and uh, body parts were flying everywhere. And I had to witness all that because I found myself in the doorway where all these things happened. And I said, oh my God, he says, I hope I come out of this supply. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I felt like a soldier almost. <laughs> as a result, uh, they, uh, after this, all these trucks, were being shot at and, and blew up, uh, it, became, it became apparent that uh, that was the end. So everybody went back to their houses and celebrated. Then you could see the partisans coming out with rifles and everything. Then you recognize who the resistance were because people would come out with rifles and they would go, they were ready to, to try to get the stragglers and trying to get the people who cooperated collaborated with the Germans because there were a lot of them and therefore they couldn't wait to get a hold of them and punish them. Women got their head shaved completely right away. Some of them got beaten up pretty badly. Naturally, the, the police didn't do much to, uh, to, uh, to protect them, but uh, most, of, most of the collaborators got shot or they themselves ran away. And many of them made it out. I mean, they made it, you know, they, they just ran away from it because they knew they would get, they would get, uh, they would get caught and naturally being, uh, be, be, you know, being shot by the resistance. It was obvious. They did manage to catch a few and those were paraded through the town. And uh, naturally some were hanged and hung and killed and who knows what. We're talking about the men, the one who really cooperated. As a matter of fact, those, most of these countries had regiments with a different uniform under the authority of the Germans. They voluntarily 
voluntarily joined these, these because they, they thought uh, one was being interviewed and maybe the average population does not know that. They felt they were giving a propaganda, a propaganda talk as telling them that the Germans were providing them with a new Europe. And as a result, with the new Europe, they were going to be part of it. As a result, they felt they were being patriotic by joining all these, this particular uh, the, uh, group. And they had different uniforms, but they, they were like part of the German army. They were sent to, to fight and so forth. And, uh, but they thought that they were part of this new. We found that out because one was being interviewed. Why did you join them? And they were young kids, 20, 21, 22. I felt like, like 100 pounds was, uh, was lifted off my, my chest. And for my father and mother, it was absolutely, uh, they were ex ex exhilarated so much that uh, it, was, it was really great. And I got in touch with the soldiers right away. Uh, just uh, you know, because all the kids did. We all were looking for gums and, and chocolate because we never had any. <laughs> so we didn't know what it was like. So the kids were always after the soldiers, wherever we could. And if we could find a Jewish soldier, then he would understand what the situation, then he would really help us. If we needed some other things, you know, he would provide us with some clothing because there was no material to be had during the entire war. So there was no, 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 we, we used to walk, we, we, the shoes were made out of wood. In order to walk, I mean, I went to school with wood shoes. The, the soles, instead of leather, would be made out of uh, wood. And this is how we, we walked. And uh, if somebody died, we used to use the clothing to, re my father would remake the clothes and so forth, so that we could wear, we could have clothes to wear. That's why I think the, the rejoicing became twice as high because we were Jewish and we managed to, to escape their grip for four years. I mean, we thought, you know, we, we must have been like a mouse trying to avoid being caught. I mean, it's exactly the way we felt. We felt like mice going, going into uh, mazes and get out of, uh, and get out of, uh, of danger. That's what we did. Every day was like that. Uh, because of the lack of uh, goods and, prime, and uh, materials, the war, you know, really didn't do much for the population because we were still deprived of everything. And the Germans actually had confiscated everything they could get, they could get their hands on. Uh, they, and they had, everybody was, was really without anything. Every primary, uh, material that you could for building or wood, whatever, was, uh, was non-existent. So we had to, you know, we had to go and get it wherever you could. It was just a matter of, uh, of uh, survival. And uh, the Marshall Plan came in rather quickly. And for some reason, he was able to pour quite a bit of uh, materials into the, it is, he imported a lot from the United States and we started to get American goods, which, uh, you know, helped a lot. And England was able to, uh, to get the uh, material, you know, from, uh, what do you call the material for my father, from, from Australia, they were able to import by then, uh, after a year or so. And therefore my father started, was able to make suits again, which wasn't, he wasn't able to do before because there was you know, no, no materials. I'm talking about uh, cloth, no cloth. So, uh, so we started to live again uh, as materials, you know, cloth started to show up. And the people were, needed clothes, obviously, because they had nothing. They had worn everything for four years and worn out everything. So he was quite busy. So we managed to survive there and uh, things were being imported from this land and that land and from Africa, from everywhere. And uh, wherever there was a void, it was always trying to be filled by somebody. If it was black market or whatever, you always managed. It was a very, <laughs> it's a very funny uh, thing the way people survived. 
to follow them day by day and the ingenuity in which they, you know, they, they, they found things was incredible. Horse meat was much in demand because cows were given to the Germans, so we, we had to have some type of meat and, and the horses was the beast chosen at the time. As a matter of fact, it was, uh, so it wasn't, that's where uh, you used to go and kill a horse once in a while to get a piece, a nice steak. So <laughs> that was like for a birthday present or something. I mean, it was really, it was really something. I remember uh, we used to raise, we raised rabbits in my house so that we could get meat from the rabbits. And my sister would be able to get a coat out of the fur. <laughs> or my mother. And my father was able to do that. We used to skin, we used to get, we used to get the chickens, and my, we had to go and uh, we had to kill them and, uh, and uh, flick them and so forth, just like, I don't know, it's just it's the way we lived. My father and mother had brothers and sisters, no, two brothers in the United States. My sister fortunately married a GI over there. Right after World War II, my sister was already 18, was quite a beauty. She, and a, a soldier, uh, you know, uh, took her out and they fell in love and they, they got married there. Matter of fact, she had a child there. And in 1946, all the war brides were shipped to the United States when the, all the soldiers went home. And as a result, my sister made arrangements with the newspapers in New York to, to, try, to, uh, to uh, try to locate my father's brother and my mother's brother. One lived in the Bronx and one lived in, uh, in, uh, in the Brooklyn. So they finally got together, they met, my, they answered the, the, the ad in the paper, and uh, my sister and them made up papers for us to come. Quarters were made by uh, birth, uh, you know, uh, location of birth. In other words, my parents came from Poland, moved to Germany at age 18. My father wanted to get out of uh, going into the Russian army, which was in that day, a death sentence for anybody who would go into the Russian army. They just would eliminate all the recruits. <laughs> That's the way it went. But to make a long story short, they, uh, they were born in Poland. As a result, they went under the Polish quota. Being in the East, the Americans always considered that a lot, I mean, kind of a, an, undesirable, uh, an undesirable area. So therefore, they made the quota very, very little. So in order for us to to come to this country, we made the papers up in 1946 or 47. We didn't get here until 19, the end of 1951, which meant that uh, it took us five years to eliminate all the people who were in the, ahead of us. Do you follow me? Had you been born, if I, they were born in Belgium or France, they would have been on a, on, a, 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 on a plane the next day because nobody from France and Belgium moved to the United States. I mean, they wanted to remain. I mean, there was not, to their way of life was so much better than, than in the East that they didn't want to move. Because my sister had come here and they felt it was my father had not much left to look forward to there. And uh, there was always a, a, it was very hard for him to get enough work. So he felt in the United States he would have a better life. And that was more or less the, uh, the idea when everybody who immigrated to this country. My brother came in 1950, and that was during the Korean War. And he came because he was born in France, and he came under the French quota. He came within two weeks. But within two weeks thereafter, he got drafted. As soon as he got off the boat, he had to register, and they took him right away. 
<laughs> because he was 21 or 20. And therefore, they took him in the army right away. Welcome to America. And they did the same thing with me. Because I, in order to leave Belgium, they told me I could not leave the country because I was born in Belgium, that I had to do the military service in Belgium if I wanted to retain the Belgium nationality. And I told them, I says, I had no intention of doing, uh, I knew I was gonna do in the United States. I said, I'm not gonna do two of them. So therefore, I didn't, I renied the, uh, the Belgium nationality and I came with my parents. And that was, so that was the end of that. My sister, I had my younger sister, married a Belgium and remained there. So my brother, the other one that was caught was in Auschwitz, died naturally. And my older sister was married to this, to this GI here in Malden. And then my brother was, went, to, uh, went into the service in 1950. And as a result, uh, so that's how we came. I was the only one left. My basic training was at Fort Dix. And it was very uh, extensive because it was the Korean War and everybody was going through hell to try to get trained properly in order to fight in Korea. So I had uh, my father passed away, unfortunately, at age 50. He passed away of a heart attack. He just barely had made it a year and he passes away. And my mother was, oh, was so upset. She's, she's all by herself now. So she never really got over that, and, uh, but I had no choice. I, I was drafted and I had to go. At the time, the suffering overcame every other feeling. So I really don't, didn't care. I didn't matter. It's just I wanted to get through it. That was the main thing. I knew I was going to, I didn't mind fighting in Korea, provided because of what they did for me in the liberation. So I wanted to give back in a way, and that's what gave me the incentive to keep going and going and going. So that's for, I wanted to give back whatever I got back, whatever I got for liberating us, I wanted to give back to the United States. And I was more than happy to, you know, to, you know, to go to Korea and so forth. Infantry training. And, uh, <clears throat> When my father passed away, there was a period of mourning, in which case I lost a three-week cycle, uh, a training period. Every three weeks, a new company would be trained. They would also leave, right? After four months, they would leave, and the next one would take over. In other words, every three weeks, there would be a cycle of training. And I lost the cycle, so I had to be push back to another because I lost the week. So therefore, I had to wait until the next cycle came. And as a result, I ended up like six months instead of four months. Well, I mean, I remember we got up at 3.30. We did calisthenics. At 4.30, we went and ate breakfast. And after that, we went back to the barracks, cleaned up, and came back out at six o'clock. And we went on 20-mile hikes. I was very fortunate. I weighed my carabin, and I had a 30 millimeter machine guns on top of that, and I was the shortest guy in the in the company. <laughs> and I was always dragging my my rear because I I was so small, my legs would carry me so 20 miles. It was ridiculous. I suffered like I've never suffered in my life. <laughs> oh God, it was awful. The diversity of people in there is amazing because you gather, you get together with people from all parts of the country. Now remember, if you lived in one in Massachusetts and you find yourself with people from Georgia and people from California and New York, you meet all these different minds and they act differently, each one. And it's very, it's very, uh, it's, it's very nice to find there's such, a, there's such a mix of people and they're able to live together under one roof. The, you know, the taste, everything is different. The conversations are different. The, the, there's a lot of resentments, 
between the South and the North. It still existed. The North, the Southerners never spoke to the Northerners. If they did, it was always, you know, it was always with a disdain of some kind. So I really felt that the <laughs> I never mixed with the Southerners because of that, their lack of understanding. They didn't understand very much the Northerners. I, I like the, uh, the camaraderie in it. You, once you make friends, you make them for life. And, uh, and they're willing to help you. I, many, many uh, times I was unable to do something uh, during these marches, for instance. I mean, I was given an order to run. After 18 miles, I just couldn't take it anymore. I had to carry all the stuff. And, and they made me dig six feet by six feet. And some guy, some black guy from Rochester came and said, Maurice, I'm gonna give you a hand. And he would give me a hand. The sergeant would come by and see it. He says, you dig one next to you, next, next to, uh, to Chapnik. And he, he ended up digging one next to me, six feet by six feet, because he tried to be helpful. That kind of camaraderie you don't see very much. So therefore, it's more or less, it's almost like, a, you know, they, they're willing to give your life. You, that's what you do, more or less. You learn to, 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 give you, to give a little bit of yourself to others. As I said, my company went to Korea and only three linguists went to Europe, and I happened to be the chosen one. I would have liked to go, but uh, they said no. Who am I? I mean, uh, I'm a buck private. <laughs> I can't buck the, the bureaucratic <laughs> system. I barely spoke English. Whatever English I had in school, that's what I was able to speak. And I had been here nine months. So, I mean, I was able to converse, you know, to the point where I understood everything you said. Maybe I wasn't able to speak as well as I do now, but uh, I still had <laughs> the background, the French background in my, in my head. But uh, the, the fact that the, uh, the, the French helped me because I had to provide billeting uh, wherever the Americans were for, to get apartments and therefore uh, so I needed a language and that's why they needed me so I was an interpreter. I went through high school and therefore I had three languages behind me and they took, I took a test and I knew the German, French and Dutch fluently and as a result they just put me in the linguist as a linguist there was no use for me in Korea if I spoke German and French, <laughs> which they had. They had the uh, American army was also stationed in France. They had American depots every 30 miles in France, all the way up to the east, east coast of Atlantic. They wanted to keep a line of communication and supplies to, to so they, they, we, were, uh, we were in a cold war with Russia and they were always afraid that Russia might get into the war with us. And they needed a line of communication and supplies all the way up to the East Coast in France. And that what brought it all the way up to Germany. And so they sent me to one of those camps, to one of those. And I was in La Rochelle for fought for 16 months. I had a pretty good life there in the army. I, I can't complain, as a matter of fact, I think I got away with murder because I should have been in Korea fighting with my company. I was made a citizen because I was in a service. Uh, I was made an American citizen in the same, uh, in the same building that my brother got caught and it was incarcerated. I was, at that time, the, uh, the executive, uh, the, uh, the ju judiciary, military ju judicial system was, uh, they took that building over. 
And when I got the notice to come to, go, to get my uh, citizenship, because I had to pass a little exam, uh, and therefore they, they called me over. I was in La Rochelle, which was next to Bordeaux, on the East Coast, on the, uh, the Atlantic Coast, and Poitiers was going up towards Paris, was in the middle, in the middle way, and I, got, I went into the same building, and it was uh, really, took me, uh, I, I really couldn't get over it. When I realized it was Poitiers, and that's where all these letters, my brother's letters, came from. And that was from that building. I really didn't feel like going there. I, really, I didn't want to. I never. I didn't want to be part of his death. Of the, you know, there was like a sentence for me to go back to where, to uh, you know, to uh, to witness, like somebody's going on the uh, the electric chair and witnessing me where he was and so forth. And I don't think I I, I. I didn't feel good about it, but I, I felt good about getting the, the citizenship, and I couldn't wait to leave the place. I wanted to get out of there quickly. I didn't want any reminder that he was there suffering with no boots. He, he was called us and says, I need shoes, I have no shoes. He was wearing his socks only. And uh, we did send shoes to him, managed to get some shoes to him. But I don't know if he got them or not. Now you're going back, that's right. And I came back. And they discharged me right away. The Korean War was over. They got rid of you. They didn't need the, 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 the servicemen anymore. And because my father passed away, everybody got married and I had to support my mother. So I was meant to go to medical school, which I never, I never reached because my father passed away. My mother wasn't able to support herself. She had no trade. She was always a, a, house, a housewife. And uh, so, I went into, I followed in my father's footsteps. I said, we knew, everybody knew a little tailoring because he was in the business all our lives. Instead of going to play, we'd go and work in the shop with him. We'd learn how to sew. So therefore I says, well, I says, I don't want to be a tailor, I'll be a designer. So I went to designing school at night and I became a cutter. And I learned how to cut suits and I got very proficient at it, and uh, I became a very good cutter. I became a foreman. So, I mean, I, I really started to delegate orders to everybody, and I felt like a big shot. And I, at night, I'd go to designing school, and I'd try to better myself, learn how to make patterns. I said, if I'm gonna be in this business, I says, I'm gonna try to ex ex excel in it. So I went to designing school, and uh, I learned how to make patterns after I, and, Part of my job was also to make patterns and conduct a you know, cutting room with 10 people in it, cutting all these cloth, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of garments. Well, the career, I established myself in the, uh, in North Station. Uh, it was a manufacturing of uh, cashmere coats and we did military contracts. We did Marines contracts because one of the owners was a colonel in the reserve and he had, he had the ties with the Washington, the Pentagon, and he was able to get contracts when we weren't busy with our regular garments. So we're able to provide the, the workers with that kind of help, with that kind of work, with the military help. To make a long story short, uh, the place went out of business and I went into business by myself in 1974. And I opened a temporary, a temporary store in Wellesley Square called Lorraine Cleaners. I knew nothing about cleaning, but uh, I knew tailoring. So I says, well, I says, uh, I can always get somebody to clean. And that's what I did. And uh, therefore I became very good at it. And even though I sent out the work, I had nice, good people doing the work. And I, uh, and I did tailoring, and I told everybody in town that I was able to do anything they wanted. And I was really the most proficient guy in town because everybody else were just fitters, or they knew a little alterations, they didn't know very much. But so I became very, very known, and I, in, and I stayed there for 25 years until I retired. 
I was always, uh, you know, um, thankful for what the Americans did. As a matter of fact, when I, uh, I became commander, the Jew Jewish war veteran, my uh, speech of acceptance uh, was uh, the, uh, the thankful, you know, to being thankful to all the World War II veterans who uh, participated in that war, and I thanked them. That was my acceptance speech. So uh, I really like, I really, they, I really have a lot of respect for Arthur Fishstein, all these guys who participated in the, uh, in, you know, the invasion and all that. Those are the guys who really, really put out for us and made the, made, made the world so, you know, so free. Well, I feel that I'm still giving, trying to get to give back to them what they gave me during the war. That's always in the back of my mind. And because of that, I, I'd like to be active because I'd like to give back. Well, being a veteran, being in the army alone makes you, gives you a bondage. You don't have to be in a war, per se. The fact that you were under the same military in the training makes you really bonded. When you get up at 3.30 in the morning, and you feel, and you're, and you're walking, and you're tired, and your, your friend can carry your bag with you, and he helps you, and this is what forms the bonds. I mean, uh, this is what you're trying to help each other. That's the common grounds that we, that we use. It was a very happy experience, regardless of what the problems were in it, the hardships and so forth. There was such a, a great companionship, I mean, com comradeship, that I, I really felt that the, uh, it was well worth it. I would have missed, I think any man who hasn't gone in the service really misses something. He misses a part of his life. Uh, it changes your outlook on everything because of the needs of it. You see around you, you have you know, 200 individuals in a company and uh, 200 individuals, all different. And they all have their, their needs and their wants and, they, and, and so forth. And you participate in that. And you're young enough. You're forming your mind at that time in the, the 20s. And, and I think it, it just makes you a better man. In order to, to, to uh, participate in that kind of feeling uh, where you're willing to give with all your heart, is you have to be either extra patriotic or you have to have an experience like mine to be thankful for, to be thankful to the country that helped you liberate, liberate you. And also you have to think in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the idea alone that uh, the, the country is not put together really by itself, that you're a helping hand in it. And if you don't help, the country will not become what you want it to be. And this is one way of saying it. It's like you're holding the foundation while they're working. And if you let go, the foundation will crumble and everything else will fall apart.